collective bargaining began August the 1st, as we well know. We had a fact-finding meeting, and we had a decision that had been rendered. And we have our counsel with us, HUD Pfeiffer, to share a report with the board about those findings. Mr. Pfeiffer, thank you for joining us. Thanks. Thanks for having me, and Happy New Year, everyone. Well, as we said, we had the fact-finding, and I'll get into the details of that in just a minute. First, just a little brief history on the bargaining process since the new law came into effect, which does require you to end up in fact-finding if you can't reach an agreement within the specified bargaining time. Back in the first time we did that was in 2012 and 2013. During that negotiation, the association did not accept the school district's offer. Uh, as a result, we ended up in fact-finding, and in that first year, the fact-finder ruled in favor of the school corporation and adopted the school corporation's LBO, or last best offer, that we're required to make. Each party makes the last best offer in bargaining. As we talked before, that's not really the best offer. The best offer is made during bargaining, um, but because the law requires that in fact-finding, you're prohibited from spending any of your cash balance then in each case, as we've gone to fact-finding, the school district has had to reduce its offer in order to comply with the law. Because in each year, you were willing to spend some of your cash balance in order to get a contract during negotiations. So I don't want anybody confused by the LBO. That's the terminology that the state uses. It's really not the best offer. The best offer is the one we make during bargaining. Next year came along, 2013-14. Uh, that year, we were able to reach a tentative agreement. Uh, the association did not ratify the contract. As a result, we again had to go through fact-finding. After fact-finding, the fact-finder ruled in favor of the school corporation again and once again adopted the school corporation's LBO as a contract between the parties. In 2014-15, we were able to get a tentative agreement again. This time, fortunately, the association was able to ratify the agreement. So they ratified it. It became the contract between the parties. And uh, teachers that year finally were able to get their raises both in a timely manner and to get larger increases because you were able to spend some cash balance to fund those increases that otherwise would be prohibited through fact-finding. This year, we once again reached a tentative agreement. Unfortunately, the association did not ratify the agreement, so we again were forced into fact-finding. Uh, we had the fact-finding hearing in December, and we received the fact-finder's decision on December 29th. The fact-finder once again ruled in favor of the school corporation and adopted the school corporation's LBO as a contract between the parties for the current 15-16 school year. A little bit of background on the 15-16 bargaining process. Um, we used, last year, we used a outside facilitator, neutral third-party facilitator, to come in and help the parties try to engage in a collaborative, interest-based bargaining process as opposed to a traditional adversarial bargaining process. And as you saw in the recap of the bargaining history that I just gave, for the 14-15 school year, the first time we used that facilitator, it was successful. We not only got a tentative agreement, but it was ratified, became the contract of the parties without having to go through fact-finding. So since it worked last year, we thought we would try it again this year and did. And it did work in the sense that she was able to work with the parties, facilitate really good discussion, have the brainstorming, have the people prioritize what we wanted to do, balance all the interests, and come up with a tentative agreement. And that's what happened, and the parties did agree to the tentative agreement, both the association and the school corporation's bargaining committee. I mean, that's a TA that as always has to balance all the different interests of the various stakeholders. So what was in that tentative agreement, or TA? Well, it included that all teachers who were eligible would receive a step or increment increase, and in this school system, that step or increment increase averages about 3.7%, uh, which is a little over $1,800 per teacher. In addition, in addition to the increment, there was also a 2% increase on the salary schedule. 
which on average is another $1,047 per teacher. That means when you take those two things together that on average teachers would receive 5.7% increase for all those eligible teachers, which is an average of a little under $3,000 per year per teacher. In addition, there was going to be no increase again this year, no increase in the amount teachers would have to contribute towards their health insurance coverage. As you know, many employers and many school districts, they'll give a raise with one hand, but when the health insurance in increase goes into effect, part of that raise is then absorbed and paid back towards health insurance. So it doesn't really go into additional spending money for teachers. Here you have the good fortune of having a very well-managed, self-funded health insurance program. So for this year, again, there was no increase necessary. Now, there'll come a day when there's going to need to be an increase. There will come a day, no doubt. But fortunately, this year wasn't that day. Not only is there no increase for teachers in terms of their contribution towards the health insurance, but in addition, there were going to be two insurance holidays. In other words, two pay periods in which teachers would not have to contribute anything towards their health insurance. So they would take a holiday and not have to pay their share. And as we say, for, by way of example, a teacher on the prime family plan would save about $757 because of those two insurance holidays. So in addition to the increment, in addition to the 2% increase, there'd be another $757 in this example that teachers would realize and have um, in the 15-16 school year by virtue of the two insurance holidays. There was also a provision to eliminate the requirement that teachers use mail order for certain prescriptions. There was a clarification with respect to placement of teachers that uh, have a master's degree. Uh, there was an agreement that we would provide an additional paid travel day for bereavement leave. There were increases to dental implant and major services for dentists on the dental premier list and non-participating dentists move that up to 80%. So improvements on dental insurance. There was an improvement in terms of the quality of the breast pumps by making electronic, or excuse me, electric breast pumps available, no cost to teachers through the wellness center. Uh, increasing the contract or the tentative agreement also called for increasing the amount of voluntary life insurance is available. Um, and we were increasing that to the maximum permitted by the carrier, which I think was $500,000. And then also a modification to the grievance procedure to include the right to appeal to the school board. So all that was part of the tentative agreement that the parties agreed to, but unfortunately the association once again was unable to ratify the tentative agreement to which they had agreed during our collaborative bargaining process. And as a result, unfortunately, the parties ended up back in fact-finding once again this year. As I said earlier, in fact-finding, it is unlawful and you are prohibited from spending any cash balance. So to comply with the law and to avoid what's called deficit spending, which means spending more than your current year's revenue, in other words, spending part of your cash balance, to comply with that law and avoid unlawful deficit financing, the school board had to reduce the amount it offered during bargaining by approximately $835,000, which on average is about a little over $900 per teacher. Since the tentative agreement, as I said, was the product of that collaborative process that was led by the neutral third party facilitator, we thought that the best thing to do was to keep the school district's LBO as close to that tentative agreement as possible. And so that's what we did. Um, and it very, very closely tracks, our LBO very closely tracks the tentative agreement. It offers the maximum amount permitted by law, but I want to make sure that everyone is clear that that does not, does not reflect the compensation the board, the administration, or others feel like teachers ought to have. It does not represent the amount of increases the school corporation wanted to give teachers, but it is the most the school corporation could offer within the restraints of the law. So what's different between the tentative agreement we reached and the LBO that we presented at fact-finding? 
The primary difference is we had to, as I say, take money off the table in order to comply with the law. So we reduced the overall increase to the salary schedule from 2% to half a percent. And again, that was in order to comply with the law. Otherwise, otherwise, the school corporation's LBO includes all the other increases and enhancements that were in the tentative agreement. I have them all listed here, but I won't go through them all. But it still includes the, on average, 3.7% increment or step increase. Another half a percent on top of that is a salary schedule increase, the insurance holidays, and so forth. So all that was still in our LBO. As I said, we had the fact-finding hearing in December. The fact-finding hearing was held on December 11th. It was conducted by a neutral third-party hearing officer appointed by the state of Indiana. She was assisted in this by a neutral third-party financial consultant who also was appointed by the state of Indiana. On December 29th, the fact finder entered her decision. And the fact finder once again chose the school corporation's LBO as the contract for the parties for the 2015-16 school year. IERB made that decision public on January 6th, and it's now available on the IERB website. And you can see a link to that here. So what's the basis for the fact finder's decision? Well, she based her decision on a number of factors, including the following excerpts from the report. So I want to just pause and make sure you understand. What I'm going through now is, instead of trying to um, give my take on the decision or try to characterize the decision, I thought it best just to provide quotations, quotes from the fact finder herself in terms of why she decided what she did and what she said about her decision. So these are quotes, and on each one I have cited, FF stands for fact finding, and then the number behind it is the paragraph. Her decision is in numbered paragraphs, so it's a numbered paragraph where this quotation is, uh, occurs. So she said that it's the conclusion of the fact finder that the CCEA proposal does not serve the interests of Carmel Clay students and is inconsistent with applicable law. She also said that the CCA proposal results in deficit financing and therefore expressly violates this prohibition, the prohibition on deficit financing that I mentioned a minute ago. She said that the association's proposed change to the salary schedule, quote, may decrease morale and create discord amongst teachers beginning new careers. She also said that the CCEA proposal would have the effect of prohibiting the school corporation from exercising flexibility of any kind and recruiting the most highly qualified teachers. As you see in the next bullet point, she also concluded that the association's proposal was, quote, clearly more divergent than the CCSC proposal as compared to the tentative agreement and the previous three collecting collective bargaining agreements between the parties. The fact finder also went out of her way to explain and make it clear, as you well know, that all of you and we wanted teachers to get a 2% increase to the salary schedule in addition to the step or increment increase, just like all of your other employees received. And in that regard, she said, quote, in this instance, the material presented during fact-finding establishes clearly and without contest that the CCSC intended all Carmel Clay School staff, including both the teachers and the non-teaching staff, to receive a 2% salary increase. The CCSC was prepared to expend financial resources on hand, which it could do during the collective bargaining phase in order to ensure this salary increase occurred for all of its employees. In other words, during bargaining, you were willing to spend cash balance in order to fund that increase for all employees, teachers, and all others. The fact finder went on to say that the failure to ratify the TA caused them to lose out on their opportunity to share in the CCSC's anticipated 2% salary increase 
because following a declaration of impasse, the CCSC is no longer permitted to spend funds on hand. And that was at paragraph 79 of her decision. So this is the second time in three years that the union leadership has agreed to a tentative agreement but failed to get it ratified by its membership. And unfortunately, as a result, teachers once again will receive less than the school corporation offered during bargaining. A couple of points we want to clarify in the fact finder's decision. The first one is that uh, her calculation of the remaining surplus after funding the school district's LBO in a footnote, she said that there was a, dis a difference between her calculation um, and the one that the school district had made. Uh, that was because of a mathematical error. Mr. McMichael found that mathematical error in the fact finder's calculations, not in ours. Um, and in fact, the surplus really is what we had in our materials, which is a little over $124,000. And in the fact finder's decision, as you'll see in her decision, she had a lot of discussion about a Jay County case that may or may not impact Carmel Clay and other school districts around the state. It's on appeal right now. Um, and because of the uncertainty of that case in our LBO, we had a provision that said we would continue to have the flexibility to place new hires um, on the salary schedule, just like we've had in the past and just like was agreed to by the association in the tentative agreement. But if for some reason the Jay County case does become applicable to Carmel Clay and we can no longer do that, then what we would do is place new hires consistent with their experience level. And that would be consistent with their experience, whether that experience was as a long-term sub within the Carmel Clay district or teaching in some other district around the state. Um, and the fact finder in one of her later paragraphs, I think misunderstood and thought that our proposal uh, said the same thing as the association's proposal. The association had proposed that all new teachers be placed on that bottom rung of the salary schedule, that they wouldn't get credit for any of their experience teaching anywhere else, and that the only way they could get above the bottom rung is if they'd had prior experience within Carmel Clay. If they taught anywhere else, they wouldn't get experience. I think she just confused that point, so I just want to clarify it for you to make sure that you know and the public knows that if Jay County does become operative as to Carmel Clay and other school districts around the state, then we would be giving teachers credit for all of their prior teaching experience, not just experience within Carmel Clay. Uh, one other clarification, there were, there was some discussion and some email traffic saying that, well, would any teachers have to pay anything back under the school district's LBO and the fact finder's decision? And the answer to that is no. Everybody is getting an increase. If you're eligible for it, I, sh I should say everybody's eligible. Obviously, you have the evaluation criteria that's mandated by state um, so that if you got an ineffective or needs improvement evaluation, you, you're not eligible for an increase. But other than that, everyone who's eligible for the step increase gets a step increase, and everybody, um, in addition to those at the top of the schedule, get a half a percent increase on top of that. So everybody's getting an increase. It's less of an increase than they would have gotten under the tentative agreement, but nevertheless, they're getting an increase, and nobody has to pay anything back. So what happens next? Well, the association has 30 days from the date of the decision. That was December 29th. So they have 30 days from that date to decide whether to appeal the fact finder's decision. If the association does not appeal, then the school corporation, after that 30-day period expires, will be able to implement the salary increases and all the other benefit enhancements in its LBO. If the association appeals, then the school corporation would have to wait to implement its LBO and teachers would have to go even longer without a salary increase or getting the benefit of those other enhancements that were part of the school corporation's LBO. Are there any questions? Thank you, HUD. And the floor is, wow, very loud. And the floor is open to questions. Yes, Tricia. I have a question, HUD. I don't think this is really for you, but um, in the past, um, we've put this on our website, we've linked to this report so that our community has a quick reference. Do we have any plans to do that this year? We do. Okay. We have that on uh, the, the first um, information on that, and this will be posted on the website tomorrow. Okay, thanks. 
And I did have one question for you. You had stated that the association has 30 days to appeal. You stated that December 29th, the date we were all received the findings. Um, is it that? I guess I, I might have read somewhere that it was the date that IRB received the information as compared to that date. So could you clarify that for me? Yeah, I believe, I'll double check it, but I believe that it's 30 days from the date of the fact finder's decision, which was the 29th. Okay. There is a lag time. Well, it's interesting. Under a rule that IRB has, there is a little lag time when IRB gets it. And then, of course, they made it public. As I said, I think it was January 6th. I had it in my um, presentation, the date they made it public. But I, I'm, I'm fairly certain it runs from the 29th of December. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Hi, thank you for bringing this to us. Um, we are, um, we thank you for your leadership and for working with our team and um, helping us get to a TA. And we are hopeful that in the future we have a TA that's ratified. Um, well, thank you. And we, um, you know, nobody, none of us wanted to end up in fact finding, but. Uh, once we're in fact finding, obviously we had to comply with the law and, and uh, uh, please that the fact finder chose our LBO if we had to end up there. To Layla's point, HUD, uh, on slide 16, um, in your experience, how many TAs have not been ratified in your time as a school attorney? Well, I can say both as a school attorney and in the private sector, I've been bargaining contracts for 33 years and I've had only three occasions on which a TA was reached with a union bargaining committee and then it wasn't ratified. Two of them are the two years we've had with Carmel. And the third one was with a public sector union with AFSME. The AFSME leadership then regrouped. It took additional efforts to educate their membership, get out the vote, and then took the, took the TA to a second vote and passed it. So I've never had it where the TA didn't eventually become the contract other than here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Hun. We appreciate you being here and um, I guess keep us posted if there's anything else that comes to the pipeline. Thank you. Thank you.